Did you know that the Jews at the time of the Quran were able to expose and refute Muhammad's claims as a prophet? Not only that, but they left clear evidence in the Quran itself that shows how they were able to trick Muhammad into exposing himself. Let me tell you the full story. When Muhammad started his calling, claiming that he is a messenger from Allah or God, he was still living in Mecca. The people of Mecca simply didn't accept his claims. They couldn't trust or believe that he was truly a prophet. So they asked him to perform miracles or signs to back up his claims. His response was verse number 59 in Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, saying, وَمَا مَنَعْنَا أَن نُرْسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَلُونَ Meaning, and we refrain from sending the signs or miracles only because the men of former generations treated them as false. This response in itself is illogical and cannot come from an old just God. Imagine a father telling his son, you're not getting any toys because your older brothers broke their toys when they were given one. Punishing someone for the sins of others or even generations past. This is totally unfair. But let's get back to the story. Muhammad couldn't perform miracles to convince the people of Mecca of his prophethood. So the people of Mecca decided to ask the Jews for their advice. Why the Jews, you may wonder? Simply because the Jews had their own scriptures and they are most familiar with prophethood and what makes a man a prophet and what does not. One of the major Islamic interpretations, Tafsir al-Qurtubi, tells us the details of this story. Al-Qurtubi, a very famous Islamic scholar, as well as Ibn Ishaq, tells us the story of Quraysh sending two of their men named An-Nadr ibn al-Harith and Uqba ibn Abi Ma'it. They sent them to some Jewish rabbis in the Medina to ask them about Muhammad's claims. The Jewish rabbis told them, Ask Muhammad about three things. If he can answer them correctly, then he is a prophet. And if he can't, then he is a fraud. Go and ask Muhammad about the spirit, the young men from ancient time, how many were they and what was their story. And ask him about Dhul Qarnain, the two-horned one. And I'll put all the references for this story in the description under the video. Now, these three things that the Jewish rabbis asked about may appear to the naked eye as, as if they are three separate and random questions. But they are neither separate nor random. It was a brilliant tactic, and I will explain why in a moment. Meanwhile, the men went back to Quraysh and asked Muhammad about those three things. Muhammad, having no clue about these things, he replied, Leave it with me. I will answer your questions tomorrow. And the men left. As Islamic tradition tell us, according to Al-Qurtubi and Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad couldn't give them an answer next day. Not even a week after. Not even 10 days later. 15 days later and Muhammad couldn't figure out what they were asking about. Until the people of Mecca started mocking and teasing him. Muhammad said he will tell us tomorrow and here we are 15 days later and still no show. Then Finally, Muhammad claimed that Angel Gabriel came to him with the answers. Those are the answers he gave and you see in the Quran today in Surah 17 and 18. Surah Al-Isra number 17 verse 85 وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلُ الرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And they ask you about the spirit. Say the spirit belongs to the domain of my Lord and you were given only little knowledge. An answer that shows clearly that Muhammad didn't understand the question of the rabbis. Of course everything in the world belongs to the domain of the Lord. That's not an answer. Plainly Muhammad is saying, I don't know. God knows what the spirit is and you too have very little knowledge. And of course at that point the Jews were like, yeah right. Then Muhammad goes in Surah Al-Kahf number 18 verse 83 and says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِّنْهُ ذِكْرًا and they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn, say I will tell you something about him. And then he tells the stories and the legends of Alexander the Great and his conquers from the east to the west and trapping Gog and Magog. Once again, Muhammad didn't understand the question and linked Dhul Qarnayn to the wrong legends. 
And he did the same mistake with the third question about the young men and how many were they and what their story was. He simply didn't know which young men the Jews were asking about. So he gave them the wrong story of Ashab al-Kahf, a Christian legend known as the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. A Christian legend about the young men who slept in a cave for a prolonged period of time. So here we have to ask, so why were these answers all wrong? And what were the Jews really asking about? How do Jews identify prophets? And what was brilliant about their tactics to expose Muhammad's claims? How were these three questions related to each other in order to trick Muhammad into error? To find out the answer to these questions and understand Muhammad's big mistake, we need to go back in time. For a long period before Islam began, both Christians and Jews tried to classify and canonize the books of the Bible. A few decades prior to Islam, an interesting conflict and debate arose between Christians and Jews, precisely around the prophetic books. The Jewish Bible is divided into three sections. Torah, the first five books that consist of the law, Ketuvim, which means the writings, and Naviim, which means the prophets. When it came to classifying and canonizing the book of Daniel, a big argument happened between some Jewish rabbis and other Jewish sects and Christians. They argued whether the book of Daniel should be included in the Naviim section or in the Ketuvim section. In fact, the core argument was about whether Daniel is a prophet or not. Jews then canonized the book of Daniel in the Ketuvim, while Christians put the book of Daniel in the prophets Naviim. And the debate continued for decades. Daniel himself claimed that he, he had seen a vision, but in rabbinic sources, there is a clear distinction between a prophetic vision and a prophecy through the Spirit of God, which is called in Hebrew, Ruach HaKodesh, in Arabic, Ar-Ruh Al-Qudus, or the Holy Spirit, which is sometimes referred to just as the Spirit, Ha-Ruach, Ar-Ruh. And again, you will find all the references in the description box under the video. This is the spirit that the Jews asked Muhammad about, and he had no clue what they were talking about. Since Daniel was a hot debate topic, whether he was a prophet or not, until just a few decades before Muhammad, it seemed most relevant to ask Muhammad the same questions about his revelation. Ask him about the spirit, they said. Fifteen days Muhammad disappeared trying to find clues with no luck. So he came back with, the spirit belongs to the domain of my Lord and you were given only little knowledge. What a joke, the Jews exclaimed, as well as the people of Mecca. And since Daniel is a prophet or not was the hot debate, the Jews asked two more questions from the book of Daniel. They asked about the three young men and Dhul Qarnain, which are also mentioned in the book of Daniel. Do you know about these, Muhammad? Again, Muhammad had no clue what they are talking about. To Muhammad, the questions seemed too vague and even random and not linked to each other. Brilliant tactic, because even if their questions confused Muhammad, it shouldn't confuse God. Muhammad, as a human, may get confused, but surely God will know what they're asking about. After all, we're talking about a few decades of debating prophecy and the prophethood of Daniel. Surely God will be able to prove Muhammad's prophethood if he is a true messenger from God. But then Muhammad couldn't come up with the answers for 15 days, even though he said, I will tell you tomorrow. Then he came back with completely irrelevant answers. In Surah 18 from verse 10 to 23, detailing the legend of the seven sleepers of Ephesus. And to save face, he ends the story with verse 23 saying, and never say anything, I will definitely do this tomorrow without adding, if Allah so wills. A clear attempt to save himself from embarrassment. And lastly, he answers the question about Dhul Qarnain completely off the mark again. Dhul Qarnain, the one that was mentioned in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 20. When Daniel was confused about Dhul Qarnain, the two-horned, came angel Gabriel himself explaining to him in verse 20 that the two-horned ram that you saw 
represents the kings of Media and Persia. Media and Persia was one kingdom with two kings, the two horned Dulqarnain. But once again, Muhammad had no clue that all the questions were from the book of Daniel and went on with a story about Alexander the Great and his kingdom from the east to the west and trapping Gog and Magog. Completely irrelevant to Dulqarnain, the one that the Jews asked about. And to be honest, it's not only Muhammad who got confused. All Muslim scholars in ancient time and even Muslim apologists today, they try to defend each question separately. They try to claim that Dulqarnain is not Alexander the Great and that the spirit is the human spirit. Even today, they are either unaware or trying to hide that all three questions were in relation to the book of Daniel. And neither Muhammad nor his God figured that out and gave him answers totally out of context. That was the brilliant tactic of the Jews that left its mark on the pages of the Quran, leaving us strong evidence that the Quran's author was a mere human. If you appreciate the research and content of this video, please consider supporting my work on Patreon if you can afford it. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time.